Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, I'm Lauren Wenzel. I'm the director of the National Marine Protected Area Center at NOAA, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar today held in partnership with OCTO. Um, today, we're going to be hearing about planning for 30 by 30 in the U.S., assessing protection in U.S. waters. And it focuses on the data and tools that can be used to inform some of our discussions around the global and national 30 by 30 initiatives. And I will introduce our speakers in just a minute. Um, first, what I wanted to do is just give you a little context around the 30 by 30 conservation goal. This is a global goal to protect 30% of the planet's land and ocean that the Convention on Biological Diversity is expected to formally adopt later this year. And several countries have already committed to this goal. Um, it builds on previous conservation targets, including early leadership from Micronesia and establishing a goal to protect 30% of its nearshore environment. And in 2010, the Convention on Biological Diversity established IT Target 11, which called for 10% of the world's ocean to be protected by 2020. And the scientific community has since recommended a more ambitious goal to protect our planet's biodiversity and the services it provides. Um, in January of this year, President Biden issued an executive order on climate that calls for conservation of 30% of the nation's lands and waters, praising the US target a bit differently than the global target. And that report was just released this morning. It's important to note that while today's talk is about both marine protected areas and the broader topic of area-based management, the definition of what types of areas will count toward the U.S. goal hasn't yet been decided, and that will be informed by a public comment period that will take place this year. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers. First, we'll hear from Mimi DiOrio. Mimi is the GIS manager for NOAA's Marine Protected Area Center. She manages the MPA inventory, a comprehensive spatial database of U.S. MPAs, and is the lead on analyzing patterns and trends and reporting statistics for marine protected areas throughout U.S. waters. She is an active part of the NOAA GIS community and leads the NOAA GIS team. And when not at her desk, she teaches GIS at Cabrillo College in her hometown of Santa Cruz while managing a busy home life with two young boys. Then we'll hear from Jennifer Sletton, who is the lead attorney for oceans at Protected Seas, the ocean branch of the Anthropocene Institute. Her responsibilities include fisheries and ocean law research for the Protected Seas Marine Managed Area Map and Database, as well as research and writing on ocean conservation topics. Since joining the mapping project in 2015, she has reviewed of over 11,000 marine and coastal areas worldwide. She acquired her JD and Master's of Environmental Law and Policy from Vermont Law School and enjoys her beautiful home state of Washington. Uh, next, we'll hear Kirsten Broad Colvert an associate professor and marine ecologist at Oregon State University, where she has studied ocean places along the U.S. West and Southeast coast and around the world. She uses data from different species, habitats, and local communities to ask, what happens when you protect an area in the ocean? And how can we learn from those areas to design even better protection? In addition to her research, she directs the Science of Marine Reserves Project and co-leads the MPA Guide, which shares science about marine protected areas in collaboration with partners worldwide. And our last speaker is Jenna Sullivan Stack, a marine ecologist and conservation scientist with a passion for finding and sharing science-driven solutions to threats facing our ocean. She is currently a postdoctoral scholar at Oregon State University, working on several projects related to marine protected area science and conservation. Jenna conducted her PhD research in ecology on the West, on West Coast rocky intertidal communities and is also at Oregon State University. And lastly, I'm also pleased to welcome Beth Pike, from the Marine Conservation Institute, who is also going to be participating in the Q&A. So I will turn it over to Mimi Duarte. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. It's great to see all of these faces um, today and to have all of our participants in the audience. I, I just wanna say a quick couple of words about um, my role and, and the importance of our collaborations and our partnerships moving forward as we, as we look to 30 by 30. The 30 by 30 initiative really presents us with a unique opportunity um, that will help us unpack and explore and unravel some of the complexity in our ever-changing conservation seascape. At the MPA Center, we are well aware of this complexity and how hard it is to actually catalog and track and map the important places in the ocean that contribute to conservation. So this 30 by 30 call to action really highlights a more concerted and integrated approach that's iterative and open for collecting information um, on place-based management in U.S. waters. And the need to create a process where we're continually gathering and cataloging and updating and revising 
these this information so that we can get a better understanding of not only where these places are but what types of contributions they can potentially make to conservation and 30 by 30 also reminds us of the value and the importance of collaborations and partnerships we can't do this alone and we definitely need to keep each other in check and learn from each other and these partnerships and collaborations can help us both track and catalog the place-based measures of importance where they are and what they do but also to help us design and implement processes that engage with ocean users and stakeholders to understand that important piece of how these areas actually contribute to conservation overall so i'm thrilled to be here to um, to introduce and to be part of the conversation i've had the the pleasure of working with all of the folks who are presenting today and i really see the the work that we're doing collectively as complementary and that there's so many more opportunities um, in years to come for how we improve what we're doing so hopefully this dialogue will will share with you, you know, where we are and where we're hoping to go so with that i'm going to turn it over to uh, to jen slatten from protected seas to talk about the protected seas database and i look forward to the q a that follows thank you mimi um hoping everybody can see my screen now um my name again is Jennifer Sletton and I'm the lead attorney for Protected Seas um, and I'm also the co-lead on the Protected Seas Navigator which is our database um, that I'm going to be presenting about today. Um, so our project started about six years ago as a public-private partnership with NOAA and uh, we sought to, to fill a gap um, in availability of um, detailed marine regulations that apply in marine protected areas on the water. Um, and soon into our project, we realized that MPAs are, of course, a very important tool for protecting marine spaces and marine species. Um, but we also recognize there's potential in analyzing the entire regulatory seascape beyond only MPA management. So to inform any 30 by 30 dialogue, we need to know the range of regulations which are significant to this conversation. Each piece of ocean has numerous overlapping regulations, which can make it difficult to get a clear idea of the regulatory seascape. Uh, regulations aren't always available um, or easily available. They're not always clear or transparent, and they can be pretty complex. Um, so as I'm sure you can imagine, compiling this information um, is a significant effort that requires tough decisions that then have to be applied consistently across all, <clears throat> all regions. So our project um, has the goal of compiling and mapping MPA and marine managed area regulations um, as an open access, one-stop resource for the general public, particularly the marine using public. Um, and for the countries and regions we've completed, our data set provides a comprehensive library of permanent place-based restrictions on marine life extraction and other marine activities. For our US data set, we have NOAA's MPA inventory, but also non-MPAs. So we include fishery management areas, we include um, whale and manatee speed zones, water quality areas, military areas. The list really can go on and on depending on what regulations you find and what region you're looking at. In total, our US database has approximately 4,500 sites. For each area that is in our database, uh, we review, cite, and summarize relevant regulatory information. And then we note specific fishing gears and other human activities um, as either allowed, prohibited, restricted, or unknown. We also include a level of fishing protection score that I'll um, get into more detail in just a moment. Um, these indicators and scores are standardized across all regions and all areas in our database, regardless of an area's designation as, a, as an MPA or not an MPA. So this way users can quickly determine where restrictions are strongest and cross compare across regions. We also learned some lessons along the way. So we quickly, so here I'd like to mention some caveats. Um, we noticed that uh, regulations don't always reflect what happens on the water. So um, if we're looking at a regulation on a particular activity and the the language is not completely clear we, and it's ambiguous, then we, we tend to err on the side of coding it as a restricted activity. So in practice, for example, this may look like we, we're looking at a regulation on a particular fishing gear and the, the language says that fishing gear is prohibited for use on a particular species. That to us is not a prohibition, it's a restriction because it's limited to that one species. And, 
there may be other species. So in a given region, that may mean um, in practice, actually, that regulation results in a prohibition because that species is the only one that you would take with this fishing gear. But the same might not be true in a different region. So in order to keep our database consistent, we apply this um, regulatory interpretation across all of the regions in our, in our database. Um, also, we review each boundary individually. So um, there are often overlapping areas. Um, and so a given piece of ocean may actually cumulatively be more protected when you look at all of the regulations that apply in one piece of ocean than when you look at just one boundary. And I'll have an example for, of that in just a moment. Our uh, protected seas level of fishing protection score um, has been a part of our uh, research from the very beginning. We de developed it really early in our process. Um, and are in the LFP for short, um, it's based on fishing, how fishing is regulated. It does not reflect how fishing is, how the regulations are followed. So that ultimately um, depends on enforcement compliance and awareness, of course. Uh, just a quick breakdown of our level one to five. Um, one means uh, the least restrictive category. So that means a given boundary that we're looking at does not have any fishing restrictions um, beyond what applies already in, say, a larger area surrounding that boundary. So prime example would be the EEZ has several fishing restrictions. Those are reflected in the EEZ boundary, but not the smaller boundaries within. Um, a level two is, means there's at least one fishing restriction or, or very few. Um, a three means there are significant commercial and recreational um, fishing restrictions, but there's still a lot left that is allowed. Um, and four and five, we consider highly restrictive. Um, four is almost a no-take area with very few exceptions for recreational or subsistence fishing. And then five is a no-take or no entry. All right, so we'd like to provide you with a snapshot of what you can do with our data based on our level of fishing protection um, score and also the regulation research that we've done. Um, looking at the United States here, um, Again, this is based on our LFP score. Um, for ease of use, um, we've co uh, combined levels four and five as highly protected from fishing and levels one and two as least protected from fishing. And you can quickly see that um, about 26% of US waters um, are protected um, according to our LFP. Um, and another 7% are moderately protected. Um, but if you break down by region, you can see that the vast majority of that number comes from the Pacific Islands um, due to the marine national monuments out, out there. And the moderately protected category main contributors are the West Coast and Alaska. The vast majority of the um, U.S. continental waters are in the least protected category, though you can also see that um, almost all of it is, is at least regulated um, and has some restrictions that apply. Drilling down to the state level, you can see an example here in California. Again, we've we've combined four and five here as highly protected and left level three as moderately protected. Um, and it shows that the total waters off California, depending on what qualifies as protected, um, may be anywhere from 0.5 to about 28%. Um, protected. So it, it really will depend on the definition. Um, and this also shows how management can really vary significantly between state waters and federal waters. So you can see that 13.4% of California's state waters are highly protected, um, according to, again, according to our level of fishing protection score, and um, less than 0.2% of federal waters are in that same category. Um, so we'll be interested to see, um, again, what qualifies as um, protected or as um, other effective conservation measures and um, how that will affect these numbers. So these two stats um, were really uh, boundary-based stats, and for many of you, they may not be all that surprising. Um, and so we're, we used our data to, look, to dig a little deeper and look at how you can go beyond the boundary to see how uh, each piece of ocean is protected when you when you go beyond site level based protection. Um, this is the subregion of central California. 
Um, and it really shows how highly managed this area is based on maximum level of fishing protection here on the left and cumulative gear protections, uh, sorry, gear prohibitions on the right. So you'll see we broke it back down to the one to five level here on the, on the left. And we have eight gears that we code for. And so this is only where we've said there is a prohibition on that gear. Um, this geography includes nearly 150 MPAs in managed areas and each individual 10 square kilometer hex grid cell has at least six or more um, overlapping management areas with um, hotspots of 16 to 20 in the northern area there. Um, and so let's have a look. So if you look off the area on, of Santa Rosa here, the light, the area in light green, you see that the the highest, the maximum level of fishing protection that we've assigned there is a two. But if you look at that same area on the other map, there are up to five gears prohibited in that same area. So this is an example of how viewing the the regulations or viewing the data in this way can reveal a, a different story uh, of marine protection. All right, and then finally, we can um, now also view our data. Um, uh, we can use our data to view individual gear types and activities. Um, here's an example of restrictions and prohibitions on bottom trawling in the United States. So you can see that the vast majority is at least restricted, if not prohibited, to bottom trawling according to, to our research and, and the regulations that, that we were able to access. Um, I want to be upfront and say I realize that this image will raise quite a few eyebrows. Um, we, what you can't see here is the choices that we had to make um, and do keep in mind the nuances of the data when you're looking at this. So as I mentioned earlier, this, the regulations don't always reflect what actually happens on the water. So this is an image of, of the regulations that we were able to find. We are aware that there are large areas depicted in yellow here that um, people in the area know would normally be um, or effectively would be a red area prohibited to bottom trawl. So again, this reflects what the regulatory information gave us. Um, and sometimes they're just, no matter how deep you dig and, and whether you know that there's a gap there, you, it's you can't find the data to, to kind of bridge that gap. Um, data just are only as good as the support from stakeholders and the information that's available and out there. All right, so to wrap up, protection assessments require reliable data, as I mentioned, and that reliable data in turn requires accessible and reliable information. Um, these assessments may also require looking beyond the boundaries of MPAs and managed areas at the overlapping measures in a given piece of ocean. Um, our team has done significant work to research and gather marine regulations, and we believe our tool can help inform uh, the 30 by 30 discussion. Um, and it's also just a useful resource for regulatory information. Um, we're committed to accuracy and being up to date, so we always invite feedback and review of our data, so please feel free to reach out. Um, we watch with interest uh, as this uh, discussion develops and um, hope that our, our tool can inform progress towards that goal. Um, thank you so much to Noah and Octo for inviting me to speak on this panel, and thank you for everyone, uh, everyone for tuning in. Um, Please, again, feel free to reach out if you would also like us to present to your organization. Uh, and I will hand it off to Kirsten. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to be here with you today. Um, thanks so much, Jennifer, and thanks, Mimi, and thanks also to Lauren and the MPA Center team, and to Sarah and EBM Tools Network for uh, inviting me to speak. You know, in um, Mimi's opening remarks, it really um, made me think about this all hands on deck kind of moment that we find ourselves in. I mean, we we have these lofty goals, and we need attorneys who can go through the regulatory structures and present what um, Jen just did and all the information that is layered on top of each other. Um, we need the keepers of the data like the MPA Center to have a handle on what's where and where the boundaries are um, and why. And we need uh, policymakers who are making decisions about our goals. 
we need scientists who are collecting data inside protected and unprotected areas and giving us a sense of where we are, how much we have, and where we still need to go. And we really also need a way to pull all this information together. And um, that's what I want to talk to you about today, um, a process that we've been undergoing um, for the last five plus years called the MPA Guide as a way to um, operate as a framework, bringing together all these different pieces of information so we can get a sense of really um, if we're meeting our goals. So I'm speaking today along with my colleague Jenna Sullivan Stack, but also on behalf of all these found partners of the guide um, and numerous co-authors and other collaborators. So when we think about goals, we've got some pretty clear ones laid out before us. Um, here's a wording from the executive order. Um, this idea that we are um, on the path to conserve at least 30% of our lands and waters by 2030. Um, the goal for coastal communities, but really all US citizens, right, to play a role in protecting and restoring coastal ecosystems, vulnerable coastlines, um, sequester carbon, support biodiversity and fisheries, all of this to mitigate climate change, strengthen resilience. These are the goals we're working towards, um, but that's a pretty tall order. How do we achieve this? We're gonna need a range of tools, right? It's not just one size fits all, it's not one tool fits all. And so uh, we're gonna need climate mitigation, pollution reduction, restoration, marine managed areas, sustainable fisheries. Um, MPAs, other effective conservation measures. And a lot of times in these dialogues, we hear uh, talk about MPAs. Well, why is that? An MPA um, is a clearly defined geographical space protected by legal or other effective means. And importantly, internationally, the accepted definition of an MPA, this is from IUCN, is that the primary goal is the conservation of nature. So they arrive at that, you know, IUCN passes resolutions, um, with our voting members, countries, organizations, um, rights holders. And um, when you distill all those uh, uh, resolutions, this is what it leads you for. It's the primary goal is the conservation of nature. So it's just a helpful way to kind of say, this is what the tool is. It's not this, it's not that. And because conservation of nature is a primary goal, that kind of sets a path for what may or may not happen there. So it's important because we um, have been tracking MPAs globally. I don't mean just me. I don't mean just my collaborators, scientists from all over the world. Um, and some of these MPAs have been studied for upwards of five or six decades at this point. And what we know from these data are that if areas are effectively protected, particularly if they're fully and highly protected, they can protect biodiversity, enhance fisheries in adjacent areas, protect ecological balance, buffer against mistakes and uncertainty, provide reference areas so we can understand what's happening outside and inside. Um, they can protect culturally important species, activities, ways of life, and they can protect carbon stores and enhance climate resilience. So there's a number of papers um, that kind of pull together all these information. Um, but what we're really talking about is whether or not, um, you know, goals can be met with these sites. Those are great outcomes, but to achieve those outcomes, a few key criteria need to be met. Protection has to be occurring in the water. It has to be more than just um, regulations on paper, MPA boundaries um, set forward via law. It, they have to also be occurring and active in the water. Also, the allowed activities and impacts should not compromise that protection. There are certain activities that are not compatible with the conservation of nature, and so you wouldn't expect to find those in an MPA. You'd find them maybe in other areas with different management structures. And also, in order for an MPA to be successful, the process is also incredibly important. Designing, implementing, managing MPAs has to include a range of different social and ecological design principles, but also all the governance, the equitable processes that go into what makes an MPA ultimately successful. And there's a wealth of 
social science information from over the years that communicates about these enabling conditions as well. And all three of these are critical to achieve the benefits that we want for people and nature, both social and ecological benefits. So because of that, MPAs are used and um, they're growing in use. So this is paper um, that Jane Lubchenco and I published back in 2015. We are kind of looking at this precipitous increase in the area of the ocean protected inside MPAs. And just um, for reference today, we're at 7.6% of the ocean protected in any type of MPA and 2.7% is fully and highly. So I'll direct your attention to those bars above um, that line graph there. Here's where it starts to get tricky, right? We're working towards, in some case, a single number, uh, the Aichi targets, right? 10% ocean protection by 2020. Um, now um, our executive order 30 by 30, the um, deliberations that the CBD is undergoing this year about what the new international targets will be. Well, when you look underneath the hood a little bit, some of these areas are fully and highly protected, some are not. There's a range of different types of MPAs. Actually, MPA is a catch-all term. So, um, now the reality is that a single percent area of the ocean is not the whole story when the question is, how much effective ocean protection do we have? So, we asked, the community, quote unquote, practitioners, stakeholders, um, decision makers, scientists, governmental and NGO folks, is knowing a single number sufficient for you? Uh, what are you needing to understand the effectiveness of ocean protection? You know, what would help you overcome any confusion around what protection is, what protection isn't, and what's occurring in any given MPA? And they said, now what we need is a clear way this is a common thread to link, you know, any given activity or something that's happening inside an MPA with the goals so that overall you can see if an MPA is set up to achieve the outcomes that it's expected. And we want a way to be able to scale this globally so we can know how much of the ocean is effectively protected and so that we can know what to expect in terms of the benefits that all this investment to set aside areas and MPAs um, is going to lead to what's the return on investment. Okay, so we joined together with some key partners thinking about, okay, who are the people at the table who are, you know, charged with answering these questions? Um, so where I sit at OSU, we are coordinating the effort, but um, by no means the only ones in the effort. So um, our partners include the United Nations Environment Programs World Conservation Monitoring Center. WCMC uh, is the one that receives all the data that countries report on their MPAs. And they compile that in the World Database on Protected Areas and um, share that via prote Protected Planet online. And National Geographic Pristine C supports um, them in that effort. So, WCMC and the WDPA is the source uh, for tracking progress on these global targets. Uh, we're also um, partner in partnership with IUCN. So IUCN has their categories for protected areas. Um, they look at management objectives, they look at governance structure, um, but essentially what's still missing is this idea of the protection that's actually happening in the water. How can we, you know, uh, use the IUCN protected area categories and um, have that initial piece of information that complements it to give a complete picture of an MPA. And then also partnering with MPA Atlas from the Marine Conservation Institute. So MPA Atlas takes the WDPA data and vets it, goes through, says, okay, yep, let's check this country reported data. You know, is this really an MPA um, by the IUCN definition? Um, is this area fully or highly protected? And so they've been tracking that for some time. So in this process for more than five years and led by the founding partners, you know, we've been getting this input from ocean experts, practitioners, and some of the meetings, just a few of many that are um, pictured here, with a goal to be inclusive, to be collaborative, to be consultative. You know, so um, the Ocean management and ocean conservation community can move forward together 
towards uh, you know a common framework and a common language around MPA so we can start to answer some of these really critical questions. So this has resulted in what we are calling introduction to the MPA guide which is available and kind of a high level summary. And right now we have a scientific paper in review with 43 authors that shows kind of all the um, structure underneath how we're um, getting at these questions and using the information to um, understand what effective means. So I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the 34 institutions that those authors represent and um, the many others that the ocean experts um, are also representing. Okay, so the process was to draw from scientific conclusions from hundreds of um, scientific papers from around the world. Like Lauren mentioned, I also direct the Science of Marine Reserves project, which is um, now a decade and a half into just kind of compiling all the information, all the data, all the research about marine protected areas and compiling it into syntheses about um, the common trends in uh, MPA results that we see. The process also includes local and traditional knowledge of MPAs. We have um, among our co-author group social scientists who have been tracking um, MPAs, uh, what they mean for local communities, what they look like in local communities, and that's also incorporated. So with the result, what is the MPA guide? It's a framework to describe MPA quality as well as quantity with four real key elements. The first is to identify the stage of establishment of an MPA. So when we're asking the question, is protection actually happening? Is this more than just an MPA on paper? This is the stage of establishment in the process to create an effective MPA. It also groups MPAs according to their level of protection. So um, this is thinking about the different activities that are allowed or not allowed, but not just what those activities are on paper, but what their impacts are. Of course, different gears have different levels of impacts if you're thinking about fishing, but there's also many other different uses of MPAs beyond just fishing. So that's included in the levels of protection. It also specifies the enabling conditions for effective and equitable MPAs. So this is what um, I was mentioning earlier, the governance structure, engagement, co-management, compliance, all those things that go into um, kind of deciding whether an MPA is going to work or not. And then finally, links this to the likely outcomes that can be expected from an MPA based on its level of protection. And here's where the rubber meets the road. Are you likely to get the social and ecological outcomes that you'd like based on um, the MPA that you have in place. So I'm going to give a high level summary of this. I can't give you all the details of the guide as it's in review, um, but I look forward to coming back uh, to this community with that uh, once it's past embargo. But the stages of establishment essentially range from for example proposed committed where the intent to create an MPA is announced. So, you know, any country's announcement or intention to create an MPA is a valuable step in showing that, um, you know, we're mobilizing. But the path to create an MPA is a long one and in involves a lot of different pieces. And so the next step is to be designated, for example, um, in authoritative rulemaking or legally uh, have gazetted with equivalent recognition. Basically, this is when the MPA is official on paper, but when it's implemented is when it really comes into force. So this is when um, the MPA has a plan for regulating activities. There's an awareness by the resource users that these are the rules and regulations and they're actively happening in the water. And finally, active management, which is ongoing and never ending because um, of course, MPAs need to be monitored and evaluated, and as conditions change and our world changes and our needs changes, they may need to be adapted over time. So level of protection um, gets at this idea of how, um, how uh, protected an area is, and um, really appreciate how Jen had laid out, and there's so many regulatory uh, structures, in particular for fishing, um, there's a lot of different types of fishing that might happen with different gears. Uh, we need to be able to also assess not only that it's allowed or not allowed, but what the impact is. You know, if you have a gear that's, you know, occurring really intensely, but 
uh, and in a small area, obviously that impact is going to be much larger than the same gear, even if it's low impact, but in a in a um, broader area and less frequently. So um, what we're able to do then is take those pieces, like with fishing regulations, look at the impacts, but also go beyond that, right? There's other activities that happen in MPAs. There's dredging or dumping that might be allowed. Um, we would say that's actually probably not compatible with the conservation of nature, but may actually be on the books as being allowed. There's also, of course, all the recreational uses, cultural uses, and so all of those are incorporated here in a scale from minimally protected to lightly protected. Now, in the process to create an MPA and start kind of accruing the outcomes that are expected, and hopefully those map on to what the MPA is, um, this is a structure that kind of shows how the MPA guide works. So those gears are the stages of establishment, you're moving towards um, protection happening in the water. And the enabling conditions here are the ones that are, you know, essential for good governance and management, um, good design. So when you look at the 30 by 30 report, um, essentially the eight core principles that are in there, including like um, recognizing tribal sovereignty are all part of these enabling conditions and the MPA guide provides those and how they're related um, based on all of these um, scientific studies to the different stages of establishment. Once an area is implemented or actively managed and the enabling conditions are placed then we start moving into um, what the expected outcomes might be based on the level of protection. So here the MPA guide takes um, you know, all the scientific studies that have been conducted in different types of MPAs and maps onto uh, what types of different social and ecological outcomes are consistently seen from one protection level to the next. So essentially the MPA guide um, can be used to identify the best type of MPA to achieve goals for biodiversity and people and that's very much on the local level um, in our partnership with WDPA and the World Conservation Monitoring Center, the plan is in place for the guide to become, become part of the international reporting by each country on their MPAs. No one knows an MPA better than the manager and the folks who are there. So um, the idea is that the guide would be useful and usable for managers so they could be reporting on their own patch of the ocean that they've invested so much in. And uh, once those data are reported, then being able to kind of slice it into a matrix like this, where you're looking at level protection and stage of establishment, can help to identify how much of the ocean is receiving effective protection, what are the areas that are not yet designated, but once they're implemented can start you know, uh, achieving some of these outcomes. And it also really underscores that to um, achieve conservation, um, the greatest outcomes are going to be coming from these sites that are, first of all, implemented and actively managed. They have to be happening in the water and also highly and fully protected. So, um, of course, those conservation outcomes bring us back to our uh, situation in the U.S. and 30 by 30. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jenna, who uh, will talk about um, a pilot project that we're doing in the U.S. We've been um, partnering with a number of countries and in-country organizations to do some pilot assessments of how the MPA guide works, to vet it, to test it, and the U.S. is one of those. So I'll turn it over to Jenna. Sorry, are you guys not seeing, are you seeing me, not my PowerPoint? We are not seeing your PowerPoint yet, Jenna. Oh, sorry. Stop showing screen. Start over. Can somebody um, pass it back to me? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You guys are. <laughs> Practice this, I promise. Okay, I think you're seeing my PowerPoint now. Is that true? You are seeing the US executive order slide. Perfect, thanks so much. Sorry, everyone. Okay, 
All right, so thank you so much to Kirsten for such a great overview of the guide um, and the process that went into creating it. And I am happy to be sharing um, a little bit about you know, the early stages of a project we're doing assessing the MPA guide um, in the United States, assessing MPs in the United States using the guide. Um, so we think the guide can be useful here in the US since MPAs are an important piece of the puzzle for achieving the goal of this executive order um, to better protect our ocean ecosystem and in turn get the benefits we need and want out of it. So here in the United States, um, we have over 700 MPAs and they go by a variety of names. We have marine reserves, marine national monuments, national marine sanctuaries, national parks, um, similar state managed areas. And they cover 26% of US waters. Um, but as you see here, it's not representative of our vast ocean area. So 96% of US MPA area is in the Pacific Islands. Um, and most of that area is actually fully or highly protected. Um, so that actually totals to 23% of US waters. But outside of the Central Pacific, only 1% of state waters and only 0.01% of federal waters we think are in fully or highly protected MPAs. And that leaves out a lot of species and habitats, including those that are ecologically or culturally or economically important. Um, so as Kirsten said, we're undertaking an assessment of US MPAs using the guide, and the goal is to be able to answer these questions. So how much of the US ocean is protected? Um, we can use the stage of establishment to determine how much is protected and implemented and actively managed MPAs. Um, how effective is that protection? We can use the level of protection to determine the degree to which biodiversity is safeguarded um, against extractive and destructive activities. And in that way, we can determine which outcomes are expected from um, each different US MPA. And we can work backwards from the outcomes that we want um, to determine what's still needed and where to invest resources. So as Kirsten said, one of the founding partners on the guide is the Marine Conservation Institute's Marine Protection Atlas. Um, and you've seen a lot of their maps in both this presentation and others in the OCTO series. Um, and we are lucky, as uh, we heard in the beginning, to have um, one of our co-authors of the MPA guide and a close colleague from MCI, Beth Pike, on the line for the question and answer period um, to share her expertise. But Beth and I are currently leading a US MPA guide assessment. Um, we're working on determining the stage of establishment and the level of protection of US MPAs so that we can better align them with the enabling conditions and the outcomes we want out of our US ocean. So the MPA Atlas team is also working globally to assess MPAs using the guide. Um, and when those assessments are done, they'll update their data set and um, and the website to share the results so you can check back later this year to see how that's going. So as Kirsten said, MPA Atlas works closely with and bases their work on the global data from um, the UNEP WCMC World Database on Protected Areas. And that's, like she said, the database that reports on progress towards current targets and will report on progress towards any new targets that are set. Um, and since these organizations are founding partners, uh, the MPA guide has been designed to be integrated into and complement their reporting in the WDPA. So in that way, we can really um, get the clarity and an understanding uh, to not only help us here in the US, but also um, to better link MPA protection with outcomes. Um, and it aligns us with global efforts as we set new targets for our ocean, including at the International UN Biodiversity Conference. So this is the future that we're all working towards and what we think the MPA guide can help us achieve. Um, a clear understanding of how much uh, ocean protection we have and how much of that is effective. Um, a clear accounting of what protection actually exists on the water in different types of MPAs and a common language for designing new MPAs that meet their goals. So I know I've got just another minute. We've got some uh, resources available online here. Um, and as Kirsten said, we have a scientific manuscript that's in review that will be available as soon as it's accepted and the embargo lifts. And we are really excited to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Can I invite you all to come back and turn on your cameras and we will um, take a few questions. So um, one of the questions that came in had to do with other impacts to marine life um, other than fishing. 
And so there was a couple of angles on this. One was a question for protected seas, asking if there are plans to include some other types of regulations that are not related to fishing um, in your analysis. And also um, kind of how that plays into the NPA guide as well. So if we could start with Jen and then maybe go to, sure. uh, great. Sure. So um, we actually already do that. Um, our we focus on the level of fishing protection. That is our one score to kind of provide an indicator of, of um, it, well, the level of fishing protection. But it also can provide an indicator of the protection overall. We found. Um, but we do also gather information on other marine activities. So um, we have codes for over 25 different activities that includes fishing gears, but it includes also other activities such as mining, diving, entry, uh, dragging, all kinds of things. So um, we do already include that. Um, and we, for each area, we have a, a summary of the restrictions that we could find um, for, for each boundary in, in our database. Great, thank you. Yeah, I just add that, right, it's really critical to think about all the different types of uses and not all of them are um, prohibited, right? There's plenty of uses that are well in line with biodiversity conservation and can be managed effectively. Um, so it's really important to understand the rules and regulations, but also the impact of each. And we have the great benefit of you know, the scientific community has been working on asking these questions for a long time. And so linking those activities with their impacts, with their kind of intensity and frequency and all the other pieces that go into that is really key. And the second part then, of course, is, um, you know, like Jen was talking about earlier, being able to actually know what's happening in the water. And that's why, um, you know, having kind of a dual approach of being able to know what's regulated and allowed, but also to have those who are there and who know what's actually happening, be able to report themselves on the impacts or non-impacts that they're seeing. Thank you. And I do want to just take a moment to invite the participants to go ahead and send in your questions if you have additional questions for the panel. I would add just one other point to that is that for a long time we've um, attributed or added information to boundaries based on what the boundary itself regulates or manages. And I think the, the future is looking at attributing a boundary based on what is regulated, not necessarily by the, the, the governance level or the jurisdiction or the protected area itself, but actually holistically through the various different levels of governance that operate in a given place. And that oftentimes it's easier to find information on fishing restrictions, but it's less simple to find information on whether or not oil and gas or mining and minerals or vessel traffic or other industrial uses are allowed, mainly because that's handled and managed through a different authority. So the objective moving forward would be to catalog all of those boundaries and understand their overlap so that we can better understand each piece of ocean and the, the varying regulations that apply regardless of the boundary. Yeah, thank you all for that. And I would just add that a couple of uh, folks in the audience commented on other influences like land-based sources of pollution, um, it, you know, air impacts that are influencing from not necessarily the immediate marine environment. Um, and there was also a question specifically about aquaculture because we are hearing a lot of emphasis on aquaculture, um, particularly in the US and asking about the compatibility of aquaculture and MPAs and are there cases where they are co-located or, or how do people see the, the compatibility between those two uses? Yeah, I would just, so the guide um, in the activities that the um, guide brings in, aquaculture is one of them and so we have detailed information about that. Of course, it depends on whether the species, whether it's fed or unfed or a number of different, um, you know, kind of criteria, whether or not it would be compatible with biodiversity conservation and then all the benefits that stem from it. So yes, it's emerging. And I would say, um, particularly with our um, local to global lens, there are a lot of places in the world where you know, people are asking that question and trying to figure out if culture is aligned with what they're hoping for from their MPA. 
we had a couple of questions related to the scope of protected seas and um, interested in the international coverage of protected seas and also um, from uh, Canada, interested in to know how many regulations were found and assessed for this analysis and how long it took to complete. It's such a great tool to dig deeper than just the polygons of MPAs. Okay, yeah, um, we do have Canada. Um, for so we, ha we have a, a, a large, we, we're not done with the globe yet, but we hope to complete that by 2022. Um, we have North America, we have parts of South America, we're working on wrapping that up. We have the Pacific Islands and we're just wrapping up Europe as well. We also have done um, the high seas. So in total, we have 70 countries and territories in our database. Um, for Canada, how many regulations? I I can't remember. Um, it, it's a while ago. It took us um, probably half half of a year, six months or three quarters of a year um, to complete Canada. And we also um, completed Canada, of course, in English and in French. Um, we do that for all of the countries that we complete. Uh, sorry, native languages. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question from a Fishery Management Council member um, asking uh, about industry involvement in these processes and wondering how have you engaged the private sector in uh, the work that you do? Um, so from, from our uh, point, uh, yeah, uh, so for protected seeds, we reach out always to um, as many stakeholders as we can um, to get feedback. Um, uh, now that it's gaining a little more attention, we we are getting a little more feedback like that. Um, we have early on in our process, we actually engaged fishermen um, to see what they thought about of our tool because that was our at the very beginning that was one of our intended audiences was was for people to use our tool on the water to be able to see where restrictions apply. Um, and we presented to fisheries councils across the country. Um, uh, uh, a few years ago and are always happy to re-engage. Yeah, I would say in general for the MPA guide, you know, we really rely on our in-country partners and um, to identify, you know, what private sector interests and organizations are most important to connect with. And so we are just the node, right, that then um, you know, kind of provides tools and uh, dialogues, you know, to be happening um, with the users and stakeholders and others who are in the country. So, you know, we ourselves, even, you know, with our bench of 45 and more um, people who are thinking about this actively, you know, can't, can't possibly look at every MPA globally in terms of the impacts that are occurring there and, um, you know, having accurate knowledge of what's happening. So the idea is that um, once the guide assessments are, uh, you know, part of the MPA conversation within a specific place, then reaching out to industry around each of the activities, each of the outcomes is um, a, just a key part of the process. Thank you. Uh, there's a comment here about how the um, UNEP WCMC provides the World Database on Protected Areas through ESRI's Living Atlas. Are there plans to provide Protected Seas Database through the Living Atlas as well? And noting that the Vessel Traffic app is in the Living Atlas, which would provide shipping data. So our data is available through ArcGIS, um, and yeah, we, we're an ESRI partner, so, so we do provide our data um, through that platform. It's yet to be a living. Um, yeah, not living atlas. But you can query it in the same way through ArcGIS Online and overlay it with Bethel Traffic and various thousands of other spatial data layers. So it is available as an integrated and updated web service. Okay. Um, another question about growing interest in mobile MPAs or or mobile measures, dynamic measures. I'm wondering if those are included in protected seas or how they would be viewed by the MPA guide. We don't have those at present, no. Uh, sorry, I wasn't sure who was going to answer first. <laughs> That's okay. Kristen or, or Jenna, any comments on how the MPA guide would view dynamic measures? 
Yeah, I think that's a really exciting new emerging idea um, for dealing with, you know, the important reality that we need to get more, um, we need to have our ocean help provide resilience against future climate impacts and as species ranges are shifting. Um, so I think it's a really exciting uh, new research opportunity and direction that um, one important thing about the MPA guide is it's a it's meant to be a living document and as new uses come up or um, new ideas come up, then we need to figure out how to implement or how to integrate those into our guidance so that we know how um, how to best protect divers. So. I'll add to just from the proceeds angle that there are fields that get at whether uh, a managed area is seasonal, conditional, um, and oftentimes if it's rotating, that'll be somewhere in the attribute table as well. Right. I, so our what we can't do is have a moving target at the moment. We It is definitely something we're interested in, um, but we look at regulations that are permanent, um, even if they're seasonal each year, as long as the regulation itself is in, is permanent in nature. That's that's what's included in our database. Thanks. A uh, couple of questions around social science and economics and wondering um, how social science is being used in the MPA guide and also whether economic outcomes associated with MPAs are being um, considered in addition to ecological outcomes. Yeah, what a great question and thank you for that. You know, this has been a key part of why the MPA guide has been, one, a long time in coming, but two, multiple years in the making. So. I think traditionally, you know, a lot of focus is placed on the ecological outcomes of marine reserves. I'm an ecologist, right? So that's my area of expertise. And those data certainly are ones that I myself and others have been collecting. Um, but, you know, the um, social outcomes of MPAs are really, um, you know, an ongoing field of research, but really the next frontier. And integrating the two, social ecological, is an active area of study just in science period, but particularly in MPAs because, um, you know, people are part of nature and this is part of our goals for our country, for the world, for um, tackling the climate crisis. So we have a huge chunk of the MPA guide um, dedicated to social science. The enabling conditions are basically that. They include some ecological design principles, but they're primarily um, social science. They include economic um, considerations, not only uh, you know livelihoods and things that are associated with MPAs before and after, but also um, you know just different aspects of equity and justice around um, who benefits, who um, who doesn't, and all those um, pieces as well. So the enabling conditions are really key, and that's the social science in the guide. Yeah, thank you. Um, several people commented that there is a strong emphasis on fisheries management in these tools and in this data, um, which is understandable given that that's such an important use in the ocean. Um, and also um, touching on the idea that Often fisheries management and MPAs are seen as competing tools rather than complementary or, or supporting. And I'm just wondering if you have any comments on how the work that you're doing can help uh, support better um, cooperation and understanding across fisheries management and marine protected areas. Um, yeah, so uh, for the proceeds database, um, we very much uh, are have always been inclusive of fishery management areas because we saw such great potential in in, in conservation habitat protection um, uh, coming from those types of areas and and we um, as I mentioned earlier we we include MPAs or fishery management areas or other types of managed areas regardless of their official designation as an MPA or not because because we see that potential um, and also in analyzing how they contribute to the to the overall protection of a given of a given piece of ocean. So um, I, I think that and uh, yeah, we we uh, summarize and review regulations re again, regardless of of the designation, um, and and see how those they those areas interplay. So um, I guess that's from our side. That's how we include those. Great. Yeah. I would just add that, um, like Kirsten said at the beginning, where we have there are so many different tools, and MPAs are just one of them, and we see them really as a complementary tool. Where um, setting aside areas 
in a strategic way, in a way that really helps achieve goals, both for biodiversity conservation, but maybe other goals that people want out of their MPAs can really be complementary to what's happening outside of the area and fisheries management. Not at odds. Thank you. So I wanted to close with just two comments. Um, first, I put in the chat the link to the US 30 by 30 uh, report, which was just released today. And a couple of you asked questions about how that report will be used, what will count toward conservation in the US. I think all of those uh, questions are to be answered through a dialogue with the public and with stakeholders. So we hope you'll take a look at the report. And I'm sure that there will be opportunities uh, virtually and other paths to, um, to hear from all the stakeholders about what you think uh, should be addressed through the, the 30 by 30 goal in the US. And lastly, I just wanted to comment that one of our um, participants said it was so great to see an all woman panel. And I just wanna thank all of our speakers. You guys did a great job and it was a pleasure to have you all. So thanks. Thanks everyone. Thank you.